Hey everybody, welcome to Bill Sky the Assembly Guy, and in today's video we're going to talk about floating point numbers. Now I've got a presentation here that we're going to be going over because there's a lot of concepts and a lot of theory that we have to talk about here. Maybe not so much theory as it is uh, what the standards are for representing floating point numbers in the CPU, or I should say better, the FPU. But then after that, we're going to do some coding. I'm going to show you actually how a floating point number looks inside of the CPU, or I should say again, the FPU. So first of all, floating point numbers are processed in the floating point unit within the CPU. There's literally a separate floating point unit. Now in today's most modern CPUs, it might be more integrated, but it still is considered a separate processing unit. Integers are processed in the central processing unit using its general purpose registers. But in the floating point unit, you've got floating point registers. And in a follow on video, we're gonna talk about how to actually program the floating point unit. And the CPU and the FPU both coordinate their efforts, but they are really separate processors, all in the same CPU package. And you can control how that coordination works inside of the CPU programmatically. So before we actually go on to any more theory, I went on the internet and I did a search for Intel 8088, 8087. Now, the 8088 is the CPU that came out in 1980-81. I know it's close, right? By by Intel. Actually, it came out earlier than that, but it was the f but the first computer that was ever built, the first business-like computer, the one like you use on your laptop or or your desktop was an IBM PC. That's why sometimes you'll hear about your computer being called an IBM PC compatible computer, and it used the Intel 8088. It also used the Intel 8087. So if we look over here on the right, we actually have a picture of the 8088. Now it shows AMD here, but that, and, and that could be because Intel and AMD kind of worked together, shared their information. Uh, Intel didn't want to create a monopoly, so AMD, AMD created an 8088 as well. So this is a picture of a of a motherboard where the 8088, the actual CPU, is, is down here, but with this little metal, this little gold door or cover, that's the 8087. And I don't believe that Intel or that AMD created an 8087. I believe that those all came from Intel. So one of them has a black epoxy cover, which is the 8088, because that doesn't run as hot. As the 8087. The 8087 is actually a, a hard, uh, like rock ceramic package that also includes this gold uh, door on top. And that's because, and right underneath that is the actual chip. And the reason for that is because the 8087, the floating point unit, runs much hotter. Even today, the floating point unit runs hotter uh, because floating point operations take a lot more CPU power, or I should say FPU power. So the FPU is the 8087 and the CPU is the 8088. And as you can see in this picture, they actually used to be separate. You didn't actually have to install an 8087. You could still do floating point uh, calculations, but they would be very, very slow because the CPU would have to separate the fractional part of the floating point unit with the integer part and then make it look like it was doing really real floating point uh, processing. So there, and I actually have a couple of these chips in my antique computer collection, and you can find them all over the internet. You can find them on eBay. A lot of good pictures here on what they look like. Right here, there's the first IBM PC, and over here on the right, you can see we've got the 8086, which used to be, the, it was the, it, it preempted the 8088. The 8088 was a little bit more uh, powerful. Here's another picture of it. So in modern, oh, and here's it looks like a picture of an NEC 8087, perhaps, with the actual uh, top of the chip taken off, or the top of the package taken off, and you can see the internals of the actual chip. Now, this probably isn't usable anymore, but it's kind of neat to have it, uh, to be able to look under a microscope, believe it or not, and to play around with it. So that's kind of an overview of the hardware of the 8088 and the 8087, and it's pretty much the same today. So how are floating point numbers actually stored in, in your computer? Well, there's a thing I like to call fractional binary numbers. And if you remember when we talked about integer binary numbers, we used this two to the power of two 
legend. And then underneath it, you would have a one, a zero, and a one. And what you would do is you would take that power of two decimal value, multiply it by one if it's one, multiply it by zero if it's zero, and then you add them all together. So that's how you would take a binary number and convert it to decimal. And, and if you don't know how to do that, take a look at one of my previous videos. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video where I show you how to do that, that binary arithmetic or conversion. To convert a decimal number to binary, which is really what is stored in the computer's CPU, you would do what I call the division by two method, where you divide by two, you take the remainder, it's going to be a one or a zero, and that's going to be your binary digit. So if you haven't looked at that, stop this video and go and take a look at that one just so you can be up to speed because you kind of need that for the next, the foil after this or the screen after this. So that's the integer portion of a floating point number. But what about the fractional portion? What about the dot or, or period and then your number? Well, a fractional num a binary number is much like an, an integer number. However, instead of 2 to the power of 2, you do 2 to the power of a negative. So you've got, so instead of having 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, you have 2 to the negative 1, 2 to the negative 2, 2 to the negative 3, 2 to the negative 4, and then each one has a value. So like for instance, 2 to the negative 1 is equal to 0 0.5, 2 to the negative 2 is equal to 0 0.25, 2 to the negative 3, you just divide it by 2 each one. 2 to the negative 3 is 0.125, 2 to the negative 4 is 0 0.0625, and etc. You can go on for you know nearly infinity. Well, not quite, but... Uh, each, each floating point uh, type of number has a different accuracy. So what you do is you multiply the binary digit 1 or 0 by the power of negative 2 in that legend, just like you did for integer, and then you add them all together and you get a represented value. So like for instance, here's an example. So we've got a, a binary number, which is the fractional part on the left of the decimal point, and a, or I'm sorry, the whole part on the left of the decimal point, and the fractional part on the right of the decimal point. And we say, okay, uh, 1101 is 1 times 2 to the third, plus 1 times 2 to the second, excuse that little bracket, because it's 1, plus 0 times 2 to the 1, because that there's a 0 in that second position, second position left of the decimal point, plus 1 times 2 to the 0, that's equal to 13. The fractional portion is 1110, so that would be 1 times 2 to the negative 1, plus 1 times 2 to the negative 2, plus 1 times 2 to the negative 3, plus 0 times 2 to the negative 4. Now, you don't have to actually do that 0 multiplication. You can just ignore it, not make it part. And that's equal to 0.875. So that binary number is actually 13.875. So that's how you separate the integer from the fractional portion of a floating point binary number. Now, it's not actually stored that way in memory because there is no such thing as a decimal point. A decimal point is not a binary value. I mean, think about it for just a moment. The computer only knows ones and zeros. So how can it possibly represent a decimal point? So the architects of the 8087, the floating point unit, they had to be pretty creative here and also know math quite a bit in discrete mathematics. How do we actually represent a decimal point without being able to contain a decimal point? So Another question is, how do we convert a decimal fraction to binary? So what this was, was we were converting a binary fraction to decimal. Now, what if we want to go the other way? How do we convert a decimal function, uh, fraction to binary? So a mathematical way of converting that is instead of dividing it by 2, or multi, uh, mul uh, yeah, dividing by 2 to take a decimal number and convert it to binary, you multiply it by 2. So what you do is you take the fractional portion of your number, of your decimal number, you multiply it by 2, and then you take the integer portion, which is the result of that multiplication, which will be a 1 or a 0, and you move that over as a, as a binary digit. You remove that 1 or 0, and then you multiply the fractional part again, and you keep going until you get close to 0. Your decimal or your fractional part gets close to 0, and now you don't have anything else to do. So here's an example. So I say dot 323, decimal 323. How do I convert that to binary? So I take dot 323, multiply it by 2, I get 0 0.646. The whole part of that multiplication is 0, so I move that 0 over on the right. Then I take the 0.646, I multiply that by 2. This is line, the second line. Multiply that by 2, I've got 1.292. I take the 1 off, move it over there on the right. I now have 292. 
I take 0.292, multiply that by 2, I get 0 0.584, I move the 0 over, I take the 0.584, multiply it by 2. So I think you can see the progression here, right? So what you're doing is instead of a remainder, you're stripping off the integer portion of the multiplication. And if you look at over here on the right, the result, the binary result of dot 323 is 0 0.01010010011. And when you actually then convert that to decimal, just to make sure, using the two to the negative, or yeah, two to the negative two power, you end up with a 0 0.32298046875. And you might look at that and say, well, wait a minute, that's not 0 0.323. Well, that's one of the issues with the floating point unit. It cannot 100% accurately represent every possible fractional number within the CPU. It just can't. Now, some of them it can, right? But some of them it can't. 0.323 it cannot. That number will go off almost at infinity if you if your computer could do that. But it's close enough. So you how you, how do you round that off? Well, the floating point unit might add 0 0.0005 to that. It depends upon the accuracy you want your decimal fractional portion to be, and then you'll get 0.323. So there's some rounding stuff that goes on in the FPU too. But again, it cannot, not all numbers can be represented 100% of the time. So how are these numbers actually represented in, in, in memory? How does, it, how does it actually look? Well, floating point numbers are stored or represented completely differently than integer numbers. Integer numbers are stored as a series of bits, 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2. They can be stored accurately, no problem. That's integer numbers. However, floating point numbers is done completely different in the FPU. And I believe the reason that they did that was to keep the heat down in the FPU um, instead of doing it the way the 8088 or the 8086 did before the 8087. So this representation is called IEEE 754. IEEE is an international technology standardization organization. Everybody has, de has decided to do it this way. I mean, there's some differences, uh, but it's pretty much IEEE 754 format. And how is the actual floating point number represented in memory? Where you have a bit that's the sign, you have an exponent, what should I raise the number to or the fractional component by? That's what the exponent is. And then you've got the fractional portion of the floating point number. And I think the best way to do that is to actually see some examples. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk about what these bits are. So a single precision floating point number Bit number one from left to right, the most significant bit is bit number one, the least significant bit is bit number 32. I know it's separate from normal integer, but just hang in there with me. So bit number one is the sign of the number. Zero is positive, one is negative. It has nothing to do with the value of the number, okay? Um, all floating point numbers are considered to be signed, so there is no such thing as an unsigned number in floating point. It's either positive or negative. Bits 2 through 9, that's the second from the left the number through the ninth. Bits 2 through 9 are the exponent. What is the power of 2 that I should multiply the fractional portion by to actually get what is the actual floating point number? And remember, floating point numbers include an integer portion and a fractional portion. And then bits 10 through 32 are the fractional portion of the number, 23 bits. So in a single precision 32-bit uh, processor, you've got 32 bits that can be used for a floating point number, and that's how they're, they're worked out. There's also a double precision, so uh, if you have a 64-bit computer, which they all are at this point, bit number one is the sign just like in 32-bit, then this time 2 through 12 is the exponent, 11 bits, and 13 through 64 is the fractional portion. So you can begin to see that the more precision you have or the larger amount of data, the more accurately you can represent your numbers. So if you're dealing with really, 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 really tiny numbers, you're going to want to use double precision floating point. And in C and C++, there's the float, that would be the single precision, and then there's the double, that would be the double precision. And that's the float and double data types. And then there's also an extended double precision floating point number, which I believe is a long double in C or C++. I might be wrong about that. But that one is huge, right? It's 80 bits instead of 64 or 32. The first bit is always the sign. Bits 2 through 17 are the exponent, 16 bits. And bits 18 through 80 are the fractional portion, 63 bits. So you can really represent your numbers very, very accurately. Not 100% perfect, depending upon the number. 
but you can do very well. Okay, so what do the actual numbers look like in the FPU? What does it actually look like when we do this? And when we finish up here, we're going to actually load some code up and try it out. So a single precision number, bit number one is the sign. So the far left, the most significant bit of a floating point number is the sign of the number. It's one is negative, zero is positive. Okay, that never changes, no big deal. So what's next? Now we have the exponents, bits two through nine. Each number is a fraction and the exponent indicates how many binary bits to move the decimal point. So what I mean by that is that the fractional part is like 0 .1011 and the exponent says move that decimal point, that binary decimal point to the right or the left using this exponent. So in this example, I have the fractional number 0 0.1011. We'll talk about what that one point is in front of there, but we have the fractional point uh, number 0 0.1011. If the exponent has a value of three, that means we move the decimal point three to the right and you end up with 1101.1, .1, or actually I should say 101.1. .1. We'll talk about what that one point, that, that one dot is in a little while. So it's much like scientific notation. If you understand scientific notation, you know, 1.38764 times 10 to the third, it's the same thing. You just move your decimal point over to the right in that case. If the exponent, if, if the exponent is a negative number, you move the decimal point to the left. Okay? So the exponent, Dan, should be can. The exponent can move the decimal point in two directions, left and right. However, remember I said negative three earlier uh, in the previous screen? You, there, is no, there is no sign for the exponent. There's no, this is a positive or negative exponent. I know, it's weird. But there is no positive or negative for the exponent. So what they did was they took the value that you can represent in eight bits, which is 255, I believe. They divided by that by two. And so it has what we call a, a 127 BIOS. This means that what you do is the exponent has a positive value in it. You subtract 127 from it. And anything to the left of 127 is a negative. Anything to the right is a positive. So if the result of this subtraction is positive, you move the decimal point to the right. If negative, you move it to the left. Now this is all built in the FPU. You don't have to deal with this as a programmer. But it is good to understand this so when you look at your data, you might, you know, on a piece of paper or on your tablet or something, write this up. What should this number actually look like? I can convert it myself instead of having the FPU do it. So that's what the 127 bias is. It means that the value of that 8 bit can be 255. If I subtract 127, that means I have to move the decimal point. So 127 from 255 is 128. That means I have to move the decimal point 128 bits to the right. If the exponent value is 110, I subtract 127 from that, I get a negative 17. So I move the decimal point to the left 17 bits. And we'll see an example. Oh, here it is right here. So here's an example of the exponent. If the exponent is has a value that when you, so I have 144 is the exponent value, I subtract 127. The result is a positive 17, so the decimal point will move to the right 17 positions. If my exponent has a value of 120, and this is within the floating point number, if my exponent has a value of 120, I subtract 127 from it. That means I have a negative 7, so I move the decimal point to the left 7 positions. Why did they do it this way? Because the bits which make up the exponent do not use two's complement, nor does have an exponent sign bit. How does it know that it's negative or positive? Instead, it uses this idea of 127 bias. Now, if you're doing double or extended, it's no longer 127, it's something else. I'll put notes about that uh, when I produce this video as to what it is, but it's not 127, it's a much larger number. And note, again, Hello, this is all automated by the floating point unit. It's all handled in there. But as a programmer, you need to know what the data looks like. So if you have a bug in your program and you want to look at a floating point value in memory, you have to be able to convert it yourself. And some debuggers will do that for you, and we'll see a demonstration of that. Uh, so 
the third part, if you remember, the first part was the sine, then the exponent. Now we've got the fractional part. So it's assumed that all fractional values will begin with a one point. Remember earlier, I showed an example. I think it was 1.1101. Where did that one point come from? Well, that one point is automatically stuck in front of the fractional value. It's not actually in the number, but it's assumed that it's there. And by making this assumption, you can actually get to you actually get to save a bit since you don't need to actually save this value within the number itself. So just assume that the fractional part, even though it's there, there's an imaginary one decimal there in front of the actual fractional part. And then the exponent is then used to decide which way to move the decimal point around this one dot. So the negative exponent means that the decimal point to the left will be filling with zeros. We'll see an example. And a positive exponent means that we move, move the decimal point to the right. So let's look at some examples. This is what can really bring this all together. All right, so up on top, and we're going to stick with single precision. So up on top, we have a IEEE 754 single precision binary floating point number. And you can see I've separated the three components by a space. So the first one is a zero. So because that first bit is a zero, it's going to be a positive number. So what I like to do is I like to just draw a plus on my piece of paper when I'm converting a binary number into decimal floating points so I can read it as a human being. Okay? So that's the first thing. The next thing is the exponent. It's those next eight bits, 1000011. I'm going to take that, which has a value of 135. If I just convert that from binary decimal, it has a value 135. So then what I do is I subtract 127 from it. Remember that 127 bias, bias. I subtract 127 from it, I get the number eight. And it's a positive eight, right? So that means I'm gonna to have to move the decimal point to the right eight positions. So now we've got the fractional bits, that's 10 through 32. I take that whole number and I put a one dot in front of it. And you can see that on the second to the last bullet line there. So I put 1.01, I'm not going to read that whole thing. I put that in there, and then what I do is, because the exponent had a bias value of 8, or had a resulting bias value of 8, I then move the decimal point 8 bits to the right, and there's my final floating point number that I can now convert to decimal. So if I take the left, I convert it to decimal, I can take the right, what's the number going to be? So I take the left, 1010011, that's equal to 132. I then take the 101, 0000, that equals 625. I stick them both together, and my final value is a 323.625. Wow. I would stop right now if I were you. If you're stuck, go back and, and, and look back at that example. I'll put a link, uh, chapter links, in this video to take you back to example number one uh, very quickly. But do that before we, you move on. Okay, let's look at example number two. Here's another example. It's basically gonna be a positive number. Oh, I forgot. The previous value was a positive 323.625, so I should have put a plus in front of there. Okay, here's another one. So I take that first line and I say the first bit is a zero, so it's positive. I, I write down my plus on my piece of paper. Now I look at bits 2 through 9, that's 133. 133 minus 127 has a bias value of 6, or a resulting bias value of 6. That means I have to move my decimal digit over to the right, 6. Now I take the fractional part, that's the third set of 1s and zeros on the top first line. I move that down, I stick a 1 dot in front of it, and then I move it... Um, now, I made a mistake in this presentation. It says move, move it 8 bits. That's because I copied it from the previous one. It should be move it 6 to the right. And the resulting number on the right there is correct. So instead of 8, I should just move it over 6, which I did. So instead of 1.1110110111, I have 11110110101.01. So I moved it 6. Let me make sure I did that right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yep. So that is my decimal binary, or not decimal, that is my fractional floating point binary number. To convert that, we take the integer portion on the left, we just do the normal 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2 conversion, we get 123. Then we take the right one, and we just do the 2 to the negative 1, 2 to the negative 2, 2 to the negative 3 for each one of those bits, 
and we end up with 0.44999694, right? The final value is 123.4499. Now, I actually did this as 123.44, was it 0.45? I believe that's how I stored it. And it's just because you can't represent this number 100% accurately as a floating point number. So yeah, so I actually stored it. I, and we're gonna do this in the program. Uh, I stored it as 123.45, but that's how it came out. 123.4499969, wow. Because it can't estimate it, or it can't store it accurately. So you have to do some, some rounding. Okay, great. Now if you got stuck again, go back to example two and rewatch it. Let's take a look at example three. Ah, this one's cool because we've got our first single precision floating point number that has a one in the sign bit. It doesn't matter if it's a negative or a one. All it is is that negative or plus that you draw on your piece of paper. So this one's a one, so it's negative, so I'm gonna draw a negative, and everything else is done exactly the same. It doesn't matter if it's negative, everything else is done exactly the same. So now we take our exponent, which is 0111011, which is 119, uh, in decimal, I subtract 127 from it, I get a negative eight. So that means that I've got to move my decimal point to the left instead of the right. The first two examples we moved to the right, this one's gonna to move to the left. So the fractional bits, I take those, I stick a one dot in front of it, and now I move the decimal point from the right of that one dot that I just added, I move it to the left eight positions, filling up each of those positions with zeros. So we end up getting 0 0.00000001. That's our fractional decimal. That's our fractional floating point number. Now, or floating point number. Now, there is nothing to the left of the decimal point. So when we convert it, the left is equal to zero. So it's zero dot something. We take that right and we convert that to floating point or decimal floating point, And we get 0 0.0045668, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you're wondering how we're doing that conversion, go back a few screens uh, and you're gonna see two to the negative one, two to the negative two. You draw up that legend and for each bit you just, and I would start from the left. Don't start from the right, start from the left and you decide how many binary bits that you wanna move until you're done. I would probably stop at the uh, 0 .0046, 4566 4, maybe. It depends, it depends upon the accuracy that you wanna represent your numbers. Now, with that said, what? how do you do that? How do you know how many bits to move over? Well, it depends. If you're dealing with dollars and cents or euros and cents, I wouldn't go more than three binary dig, bit, bits. I wouldn't do any more than that. However, if you're dealing with a number like the size of a proton or the size of a neutron, um, you definitely want to be as accurate as possible. As you get closer to the Planck constant, you definitely want to get as accurate as possible. But again, and, and one other thing, if, the more accurate you get, the more heat you're producing in the FPU. So you need to think about that when you're coding. So the va final value of that was this big long thing. This value was actually stored into the FPU as 0 0.00456682. So you can see after the 456681, it becomes, it, it's not as accurate. So it's not 100% accurately depicted in the CPU, and I should say the FPU there, actually. And this is because fractional binary numbers, which are not a power of two, cannot be stored accurately 100% of the time. So let's take a look at a coding example. All right, now we're on Linux here. Now you can do this on Windows as well. It's not a big deal. Um, it's, you can use the exact same code that I'm gonna use here. But I'm gonna use Linux just because it's easier. Um, it's quicker. So I'm going to go and create a new project. I'm just going to do a 32-bit one. I'm not going to do a 64-bit one. You could, I guess, but I'm just going to do a 32-bit one. And let me see. I'm going to use the 32-bit template. And again, it's always good to rename them so you don't have a bunch of the same name. So I'm going to say Linux x86 float. All right, so let's go ahead and do, and, and I hope you're able to follow along with me on this because this is actually a pretty good demonstration. It'll really show, show what we're talking about here. So there's gonna be a follow-on video to this one as to how to actually program the floating point unit.
What we're going to do here is just look at the data representation. So to do that, we're going to make this pretty simple. I'm going to create a, a, a label in memory called a float. I'm going to define it as a double. And I'm going to say it's going to be a negative. Now, that, this is the same number as the third example in the presentation. So let's put that same number in there. There's our decimal floating point number. Now, notice I put a zero in front. You really have to do that. You cannot do this. And I don't think you can even do that. You must put a zero in front of it. And the fact that this is a negative number doesn't matter. You have to put that zero in front. I've had problems whenever I've not done that. Now, how would I do this in Windows? I, well, I could do it exactly the same way in Windows, or I could say a float real four negative zero point zero zero four five six six eight two so this is exactly the same it's a four byte number which is what a double is real eight would be an eight byte number which would be a defined quad so again and and the real only really reason that windows has that is so the debugger is able to display things as a real okay you might have to do a little bit of stuff in the debugger on Linux, but um, but on Windows, if you say DD, you can still display it as a real number. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. Now, that's all we're going to do in this code. It's pretty simple. I'm just going to go ahead and make this, and let's go ahead and debug it. And you're going to see how this how this works. So I'm going to open this in terminal. All right, great. Okay. Oh, make sure you build it first. All right, so I'm going to put a breakpoint on the no-op. And notice that we didn't do any code here other than defining the value. And that's because I want to show you that value. And we're going to make a little change of the code just so you can so you can see what you can do with it. But we're just going to leave that uh, like that for right now. All right, so let's run it. Okay, now, I'm not going to do anything with registers right now. I'm going to go down here to memory, and I'm going to type ampersand a float. Now I'm going to make sure that it is words, a four byte word, which it already is. And there is the value of point, negative point zero zero four five six six eight two. It's this BB95A543. Now one nice thing, you can't do this in the Windows in a Visual Studio uh, debugger, but you can do it on Linux. One nice thing I can do is I can right click on this and I can say I want to show this as binary. And this is so useful, especially as you're learning floating point, there's the binary number. And if you look back at our example, that's exactly the same number as I had in our example in the presentation. Now, something else you can do with the debugger on the KDBG debugger, I can right click on this and I can say, I want to look at this as a floating point. And there's our number. Now, notice the number is not necessarily this. It ends with 81987. So it couldn't represent past this digit 100% accurately. Okay? Pretty simple, right? That's how you can take a look at it. Now, what I'm going to do now is in my code, I'm going to make one little change. I'm going to move that value into a register. So I'm going to move into EAX. Remember, this is 32 bit. A float. Now all the move does, it doesn't do any conversions. Remember, EAX is an integer register, but we're trying to move a floating point number into an integer register. It doesn't matter because all we're doing is moving bits. We're not doing any conversions. And in the next video where I actually do some floating point processing and some actual floating point coding, you're going to see the differences between the CPU and the FPU. So I'm just going to move that in there. I'm going to build it. And again, it built fine. It did not know this was a floating point because all we're doing is moving bits. All right, let's go ahead and debug it. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to show you there is some connection between the FPU and the CPU, which you might be able to use in your code. Okay, so there's our number. There's our floating point number, negative 0, 0.00. Again, it's not 100% accurate because of the limitations of the floating point unit. So let's step over or no up. And now we're going to go to registers. And here's our register EAX. I'm going to step over. And our register EAX has this the exact same number that we had in memory. If I go back to memory, if I right click on this and say, just look at it as hexadecimal, 
There's the BB95A543, BB95A543. And notice over here on the decoded value, it shows it as a negative integer. That's because the floating, that's because the CPU cannot process floating point numbers. It put the bits in the in the in the EAX register, but it wasn't, it's not able to actually show it as a floating point. I can right-click on this. And you, you just can't, well, actually, in this debugger, it will do the conversion for you. So I'm going to say real F. And it's not really that, that large. Um, so the debugger is doing that for us. But the CPU doesn't know anything about floating point numbers. That's the FPU. All right, so that's the introduction to floating point numbers. I hope this has helped you. When I first learned floating point numbers, I had to... I had to look over it over we didn't I didn't learn it in video. You're pretty lucky to have a video here, but I had to reread it over and over again. And back then we didn't even have I was working on a mainframe, I didn't even have the ability to run a debugger. I had to figure it out from examples. And if I remember correctly, I did write a program similar to what we did here, and I did a memory dump and printed it on paper and tried to figure it out that way. So you're pretty I don't want to use the D word, but you're pretty darn uh, lucky to have a video like this. So take a look at it again. Rewatch it as many times as you like. I hope this helped out. Hope to see it in our next video.